Okay, this suitor class. And it's just carrying on with what I had Chandra did yesterday and also a little bit more, especially about the lights in meditation and uh, how that all leads into these jhanas. And how does it matter if you think you're a good meditator or a bad meditator? It's nothing to do with you. It's all just the nature of the mind and how it becomes nice and peaceful. Now, first of all, when you are meditating, eventually you get to know the breath. You're opening the lotus up and you get the breath coming in. And a lot of this is just, again, natural. It's just what you watch. It's not what you do. Just like when I fly from Australia to uh, London, you can look out the window and you can see all this, this land you pass by. I don't decide to tell the pilot, hurry up, I want to get to London quickly, or why don't we go a, 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 a route around, say, Istanbul. So can you fly lower over Istanbul? It's supposed to be very beautiful. And then I can go on to, you've got no control. If you're flying in the plane, you can look out the window and you can see all the landmarks which tell you exactly where you are. Just like with meditation, when you just uh, are aware and kind, all these things like the breath, the delightful breath and lights in the mind, they're all landmarks on the journey. Not what you aspire for, but just what happens. In other words, it's totally out of your control just to see what happens on the journey. If you don't see those things, just like on an aircraft, they don't take you to the correct destination, you can always ask for your money back. <laughs> I'm, I'm very good on that. I've told many people, and I promise it, that if you don't get jhanas on this retreat, you can ask for your money back. You won't get it back, <laughs> but I promise you can ask. <laughs> Old joke, but good. So, uh, you start with this second tetrad, what you are doing yesterday, I'm just uh, retelling it in brief. You start to experience pity and sukha uh, with your breathing. And that pity and sukha is just like a pleasurable feeling. The breath becomes delightful, just as I said with Ajahn Ganha, breathing in, sabai, breathe out. Sabha. I had a lovely lunch today. The lunch was Sabha. It's very close by. That's what Sabha means. Beautiful, lovely, delightful, easy. And so then what happens? And then once the breath is Sabha and you experience that pity sukha, then you learn to calm this mental formation. And I'm going to focus on that a little bit extra here because it's a mental uh, sankhara, a chitta sankhara. And of course, people sometimes pass that by, they don't understand what that means and how important that statement is. The breath is just a breath, it's never beautiful. But when the mind becomes peaceful and once the sankhara starts to dominate, the, the chitta sankhara starts to dominate, Everything looks beautiful. Even the shepherd's pie which I had for lunch. The, pity, the chitta sankara was so strong, it was a delightful shepherd's pie. Doesn't matter what it is. If your mind is very strong, whatever you eat is absolutely delicious. I don't know what you ate today. What did you eat today? You had sandwiches? I'm sure if you had good meditation before you had your sandwich, the sandwich was sabai. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, it's what the mind adds onto the breathing. It's the aspect of delight, joy, see the beauty in things. It's one of the great advantages of meditation. It comes about that whatever you see, whatever you hear, whatever you taste, 
becomes really enjoyable. And it's fascinating. And I won't go fully into that, because I've got some stories which uh, I'll tell later on if you really want it, but they're a bit gross. No, I'm not going to say it. Don't encourage me. <laughs> but little things which you may notice, if your meditation really starts to take off, see the carpet. Have you noticed how beautiful the carpet is? A lot of the time, say, what are you talking about, Ajahn Brahm? It's just an old carpet. But once the mind gets very alert, it tends to see the beauty in anything. I always liked his quoting uh, William Blake, the great poet, 1600 to 17-something, to see a world in a grain of sand, a heaven in a wild flower, hold infinity in the palm of your hand, an eternity in an hour, which is usually the time I speak for, eternity. <laughs> <laughs> but the first part of those poems is beautiful, always it tends to resonate with me. See a world in a grain of sand, small things, so much going on in there, and a heaven and a wild flower, not big flowers, but tiny flowers. They're just heavenly, and hold infinity in the palm of your hand right here. Anyway, this is what happens when the mind starts to turn on. So then what happens? We get to the third tetrad of Anapanasati. Now this is not what you aim for. You don't say, oh, I'm here now with the delightful breath. Now I determine to go into the, the next stage. This happens naturally. The petals are opening up. It's just what happens. You can't really, st well, you can stop it by being afraid or excited or thinking, what the heck's going on? I've lost the breath. So you go backwards to try and find the breath again. You don't need to find the breath. In the next stage, the delight takes over. It's hard to find similes, which is one of the reasons why that Cheshire Cat simile is one of my favorites. You know, to see a smile without any mouth doing the smiling. It's kind of just to make sense. But that's a really good description of what happens here. The breath was beautiful, the breath disappears, but the beauty remains. Solid, real, not imaginary. And anyway, the next stage of our meditation, I'm now going to read from the Sutta. <laughs> it's supposed to be a Sutta class, and now I'm going to comply. When you learn to experience the Chitta, this is what it says in the Sutta, to experience the jitta as you breathe in and out. When you learn to brighten that jitta as you breathe in and out. When you learn to settle that nimitta or that jitta as you breathe in and out. When you learn to enter, to liberate the jitta as you breathe in and out. Experience it, brighten it, bring it joy, still the jitta, and then liberate the jitta. First of all, the meaning of the word jitta is always mind. It's that sixth consciousness, the jitta, the mind. And many people have arguments over the nature of the jitta. How can you settle you know, those arguments? The only way to settle it is to experience it. Find out what that nimitta is for yourself. And what actually happens is when you learn to experience the jitta, the breath vanishes. The joy remains, and they usually experience these beautiful lights in the mind. That's why we call them nimittas. It's the word the Buddha used for that in the Upakalesa Sutta. He gave a whole list of um, advice for what is an obstacle for that nimitta to really establish itself and become useful and still and also just recommended how important it is. So what happens, you're sitting there, experiencing the breath, very easy, delightful, no effort. It's just the breath is too, too uh, difficult not to see. It's beautiful, delightful. And then after a while, the delight is just so strong, you experience in your mind this beautiful lights in the mind. Why do I say lights? They aren't physical lights. Your sense of sight is turned off. 
This is just the way you perceive it. You perceive it like this because it's a mental object. But the most, uh, the, the closest example, it will be a beautiful light in the mind. Sometimes that light can be very intense. I mean, beautifully intense, but sometimes so strong it's like looking at the sun in midday in Australia, not Sheffield. <laughs> And if you look at straightly into the sun, you sometimes you think you're going to go blind. Honestly, that happened to me a couple of times. Looking at this intense light in the mind, you think, oh my goodness, I better not do this much longer, I'm going to go blind. And then you realise how stupid you were. You're not seeing, it's not a physical light, it's how the mind experiences this. And beautiful light in the mind. You don't have to worry, no one has ever gone blind by watching these limiters. The other thing which happens, it's not just brilliant light, it's always associated with a great deal of happiness and bliss. And that's one of the other things which sometimes comes up. I'm just saying this because you might experience this. You say no, no human being can uh, endure so much happiness. <laughs> it's a weird thing to say, isn't it? That sometimes comes up, this is really amazing, a bit too much for me. <laughs> But well, one thing I can reassure you, there's no limit to the amount of ecstasy you can enjoy. Go for it. I've got these lovely examples. Like this one example, this gentleman who came to stay at our monastery, he wasn't really a Buddhist, he was a heroin addict. And he wanted to somehow find a quiet, supportive place where he could overcome that addiction. So we had space, so we let him come in. And then he learned some meditation. And he was obviously really good at it. Because I can never forget him running towards me. I was going off to our city centre to give a talk, running after me and saying, Ajahn Brahm, I thought I would never say this. I know you always say that even some of the joys and bliss in the Nimitta stage are better than sexual orgasm. I thought that's easy to understand. But I never thought I'd ever say, that bliss is better than a high from heroin. I've never taken heroin, he had. He said the joy of meditation was even more delightful than that. When he said that, I had a lot of hope for him. But you know that sometimes you go up, you go down. On one of his down days, he just took some more heroin. Went straight back to square one. Like Those addictions are like snakes and ladders. You get to the last square and you run one more square to win the game and then you hit the snake and you go all the way down. You know what I'm talking about, the game of snakes and others? <coughs> that was really a shame. But I always like quoting what he said about the joy of these things. So what's actually happening there is the jitter, the sixth sense, is taking over and the other five senses are disappearing. So you can't hardly feel your body any sounds. Even this happened when I was doing walking meditation in my first year as a monk. It was just, you know how you do walking meditation, looking at the ground, lifting your feet up. It was in the big hall in Wat Saket in Thailand. I was really peaceful. And then it's like you hear this sound. And this sound was coming from like a hundred miles away. Oh, so. Wamawangso. That was my uh, full name. And I thought, this is really weird. Where's this coming from? So I started to pay attention, and it was coming from a monk with his mouth almost in my ear, shouting, trying to get my attention. <laughs> <laughs> I, <laughs> I'm glad that happened because that was a real example of what happens. You know, the, like noise, you're so shut off from it, it's like so distant from you. And I realised I had to go to a, a ceremony and I'd forgotten all about it. He'd been sent to come and get me. And so once I realised I'd have to come out from the meditation, then very slowly I turned my neck, noticing all the feelings of the neck as it turned. It took me about two minutes to turn around and then say, 
what? <laughs> I wasn't trying to be smart, it's just what happens, you can't move fast. Fortunately, as he was a monk, he understood what happens in meditation, so he'd actually let me come out slowly so I could go to the appointment. But that's what happens, the, sense, the five senses tend to disappear or go far, far away, and you're happily ensconced in this beautiful world of like a nimitta, and it's delightful. And I would say to you that each one of you, every one of you, will experience a nimitta. If not now, when you die. I love saying that, because you all know, you've heard it, and it's true that when a person passes away, they see a light. And I don't know why people don't understand what that light is. What happens when you die? Your five senses turn off. What happens when the light comes up in meditation? Your five senses turn off. The only difference is in death, you can't turn it back on again, it's that easy. But in uh, meditation, yeah, you have nice limited experiences, and then the uh, five senses can come back again, turn back again afterwards. But what you're seeing is exactly the same. That nimitta, that light. Now, as that uh, venerable Arachanda said, I think this morning or yesterday, when your meditation is supported by virtue, it's of great power and easy to do. So what this means here is when many people see a light, sometimes they see a light, it's a real light, it looks good, but it's like sometimes it's been smudged. It's like a white cloth has been used to, to clean all the dishes and they've got coffee stains and tea stains or whatever else stains on it. It's not clear and beautiful. And if you see a nimit of a light in your mind and it's like that, it's not beautiful, welcome. That's what most people experience the first time. But if that's what happens, even though your virtue is not that great, for the first time I started teaching this, this Malaysian man, he came and saw me, he really upset. He said, I saw a nimitta. It was like a dirty rag I'd used to clean a motorbike. <laughs> and I said, never mind. I know the loopholes. When it comes to nimittas, I'm like a lawyer who knows how to get you off the hook. <laughs> and I, I said, in that dirty old nimitta, you look at it and there's always one part of it which is more beautiful and clean than everything else. Everything else might be dirty and stained, but there's some part of it which is nice and clear. Focus on that. Zoom in on it. And when you zoom in on it, it's like all the dirty stuff falls off the screen. You just see the beautiful part. Then go to the most beautiful part of the most beautiful part. Keep zooming into the beautiful part. And soon you have this gorgeous, pure nimitta. That's what we mean here when it says, when you learn to uh, brighten the nimitta, bring joy to the nimitta, it's sampasadana chitang. It's actually what it means is like the gift of purity, the confidence, the joy, as you breathe in and out. You learn how to see the positive in things. An example of that, one of the first times I started seeing nimittas, then one of the first nimittas I saw was this beautiful scenery, a beautiful green grass and trees and a water in the valley on a nice sunny day. When I saw that, it looked delightful, but it was too complicated, too much in that image. But one thing which I did notice, on the tip of one of the leaves, on one of the trees, there was a, sm a sparkle. It was like a, the sun was reflecting on a drop of dew still remaining on the end of the leaf, and it sparkled. And my mind was well enough trained to go straight onto that sparkle and again zoom in on it. And that sparkle got bigger and bigger and took over the whole vision in my mind and turned into a gorgeous nimitta, simple and uh, very powerful. This is where any of you who have got too many fault-finding mind, always looking at what's wrong, looking at mistakes, will have difficulty developing nimittas. Don't be a fault finder. See all the beauty 
all the good, say in this retreat. It may not be perfect, but look at the beautiful things in this retreat. The people sitting next to you, they may just be noisy. Doesn't matter, see all the times they're not noisy. Get a mind which gravitates the beautiful. Just when we were coming up here on a train, because all the trains were messed around, I think one of the trains was going to go to Doncaster. I remember going to Doncaster once, many years ago. I remember just oh, having a walk in the morning. And we walked to the gardens and a beautiful part. There is actually a beautiful part of Doncaster. And anyone from Doncaster here? Okay. There is a beautiful part, isn't there? Yeah. But there's also there's the, uh, the gas works and the, the ugly part. And I remember a monk who went there before me said that when he went for a walk in the morning, he went down by the canal and the old gas works and all the ugly part of town. And I would gravitate to the beautiful part of town. This is actually an important. If you always gravitate to faults, they're there. You can't really develop beautiful nimittas. If you leave aside the difficult parts, the two bad bricks in the wall in my stories, and go to the beautiful bricks in the wall, it becomes easy to develop the nimittas. You see the most beautiful part in the image you have in your mind. And then what happens? The nimitta gets brighter and brighter and brighter. First of all, please put aside fear. The reason why I talk like this is because people do get these experiences and they think, what the heck are they? And because they haven't been taught what they are, they think they're doing something wrong. They think this is not Buddhism. And they say, well, I'm not watching my breath anymore. I'm watching these beautiful lights. That's what you're supposed to do. So don't think you're doing anything wrong. Just go for it. The second thing, they feel afraid because these become a little bit uncontrollable. The more you're trying to control them, the more you mess them up. All you have to do is be passive. Ajahn Chah's simile. Now remember, I was with Ajahn Chah for over, no, well, just under nine years. And by that time, I could understand everything he said. He had me translate for him many times. And I remember his uh, still forest pool simile. As I remember hearing it directly from Ajahn Chah's lips. He said, like in those old days, uh, a monk who went on, on wandering, they used to call it Tudong, in Sri Lanka, Charika. You'd always try and find a place in the evening close to a lake or a river. You had to wash, and maybe wash a few robes, maybe fill up your water bottle. And he said that once you had washed everything, then you put your mosquito net umbrella about 10 meters from the edge of the lake, because later on in the evening, the jungle animals would come out to wash and drink. But he'd always describe just how they would come out. Usually the leader of the family would come out first of all to check whether it was safe. If you ever think you're afraid of tigers, humans have killed more tigers than tigers killed humans. So the animals are incredibly afraid of a human being. We are the most dangerous animal in the forest by far. So they would come out and they'd look. Their eyes were not that good. They'd listen and they'd smell. And Ajahn Chah said, if he moved, if he said, wow, or any reaction like that, the animals would know there was a human being there. And even they were thirsty and just really needed a bath, they would go back into the bushes and wouldn't come out again all day, all night. That's how afraid they were. Their safety was that important. But, he said sometimes he was watching, his eyes open, but very calm, very peaceful, very still. And when he was that still, the animals would come out, <laughs> sniff, listen, and they would think no one was there. Then they'd come out by the still forest lake and they would bathe and drink and play. 
These were the days before all these movies and documentaries about nature, nature channel, about animals in the wild. This was Ajahn Chah seeing it live, as it was happening. It was delightful to see this. I remember sometimes seeing all these wonderful stories of animals in the forest. Once I remember I just we used to put out a, just a small bowl of water for the birds during the hot season in the north of Thailand. And I was in my hut. I just watched them through a knot hole in the wood plank of the hut. And what I saw was just absolutely delightful. This was Thailand. And now Thais are not usually in their nature to be organized. And these were birds. I saw all these birds come, so many different species and sizes, and queue up <laughs> in a line. I wish I had a, f f a camera, no one would believe me. But they would all first come, first serve, so one would already be in the, in the piece of water, you know, drinking and bathing, there were animals there taking a bath. And then the other ones would, would patiently wait. And when that one was finished, the next one would jump in. And also self, and there were different species, different sizes. And then it would always happen to be some bird would jump the queue, and all the other birds would also get out of the queue, peck that bird up and beat him up until he flew away. And then they all went back in line as they were before. <laughs> I never seen adult human ties ever doing something like that. The birds were far more advanced. But anyway, it becomes delightful. But he said that sometimes when he was watching these animals in the forest, he had to be really still. And when he was really still, he started to see animals come out from the forest, which he'd never seen before. More beautiful, delightful, than anything his teachers had told him about. They too would come out to play in the still forest pool. He had to be really silent, really still. If he just said anything like, wow, they would sense it and run away. And that was his similar, simile for Nimitus. If you, they come out to play in your mind, beautiful Nimitus, if you start saying, wow, beautiful. It's like they know you're watching and they're so shy, they run away and won't come out for days. And that's only the start. So sometimes he was so incredibly still that animals which he didn't realize existed would come out and play in the still forest pool, which was his mind. That was a metaphor for the pool, his mind. No, be the jhanas. Incredible states of mind. But if he made any comment, if he said, yes, jhana, that would destroy it straight away. All you need to do is be really still. So this is what happens with nimittas. I love telling this part of the light story, is that sometimes there's, for, some days, the nimittas were coming up pretty easily, every meditation. But they would come up, but they'd always be moving. They weren't still enough. And I knew that was a problem. I couldn't figure out what I was doing wrong. And then just one morning, and I, as a monk, as a man, I was shaving in the mirror, and it kind of hit me. Because I saw this young monk in the mirror. His head was moving backwards and forwards. And I realized what I was doing with the nimitta. I held the mirror as still as I possibly could. And still, this guy in the mirror was moving his head. So I took my hands off the mirror, and I stood as still as I possibly could, like a statue. Then the image in the mirror stopped moving. So that's how you work with nimittas. If you want that nimitta to be perfectly still, you have to stop moving. It's like you freeze. You don't want anything, you don't do anything. You'll be perfectly still. 
and the nimitta stabilizes and becomes naturally brighter and brighter and brighter. And the interesting thing about those lights in the mind, this, I've never read this in the suttas, I must admit, but you checked it out with other meditators as well, it's true. When you see those nimittas, a really good sign, you know that this is you know, one, a proper light in the mind, you're seeing the chitta. Whatever light you see, the color is more intense, I mean beautifully intense, not disturbingly intense, than any of those colors you see in the real world. Any white is like whiter than white. It's a white you cannot see anywhere with your eyes in this world. Any blues are so deeply blue, more blue than blue. And that stands out. That is a really decent sign that's an imitator, but you have to be careful. Because I remember on one range retreat, I saw this beautiful yellow nimitta. I told all the monks about it, they had a good laugh too. You know the story. This yellow nimitta, it was a real nimitta, a yellow light you can't see in the real world. Really deep yellow, intense yellow, beautiful yellow. But it had a shape to it. When I noticed the shape, I recognized it straight away. The shape was of Garfield the cat. I've been looking at too many comics in the newspapers. <laughs> I'm thinking the only meditator in the whole world who's ever seen the Garfield Nimitta. <laughs> and I did just what you did, I laughed my head off and that was the end of that Nimitta. <laughs> I told all the monks about it, we had a good laugh. <laughs> but actually sometimes these Nimittas do have shapes. The shape is not so important. If there is a shape there, just go into the center of it somewhere. So the more simple it is, the more beautiful it becomes, and the more easy it is to use that to take you into the next stages. So you learn to settle the nimitta, still the nimitta. Oh, I should actually mention on the stairs that go up to the, the top story here, there is actually a quote from the Psalms. And I was a bit disgusted because it's a mis inaccurate quote. It's quote up there, it says, from the Psalms in the Christian Bible, be still, it says on there, and know that, the, know that I am God. That's actually not what it says. The real quote is, be still, and know that you are God. Thou art God. And I thought that's a really amazing thing, actually, to say in a Christian book. I don't know how it got in there, but it's pretty accurate. Be still. Yeah, the mind gets so incredibly still. The five senses disappear and you have these beautiful nimittas and they're so intensely beautiful and full of joy and happiness and you can't do anything in there. If you try and move, it destroys the whole thing. And that's one of the reasons why even in this stage when people experience these gorgeous nimittas, it's like they think, they come out afterwards and if that's a language, it's like you're being incredibly powerful, and you're not there, blissing out. Pretty good description of a God. Anyway, you ain't seen nothing yet. Because <laughs> after this, and you, the next stage, uh, stilling the, the jitter, the next thing you, which happens is that when you learn to liberate the chitta, they do use the word vimocha yang, and the noun in Pali close to that is vimocha, which always refers to the jhanas. This is a point where liberating the chitta means, it's the word which they used to enter the jhana. Just the first jhana to begin with. What does that mean? I would explain more about this in the next Sutta class. What that means is when you allow yourself to get sucked in to that incredibly beautiful light, or the alternative which people explain or describe, like the light comes right over you and you go right inside of it. What are you left with? The light has disappeared now. What you're left with now is the bliss. 
every one of these jhanas, your objects of meditation, what you are aware of, is ecstasy. Four different levels of ecstasy for the first, second, third and fourth jhana. This is what the Buddha said you should do. Those of you who want to bliss out and enjoy yourself to the max, this is how you do that. And again, one of the reasons I teach like this is because as a young man, when these things started to happen, one of the things which I was, uh, came up afterwards was, why has no one told me about this before? This beautiful bliss, which was totally beneficial, beneficial in so many different ways, with your health, with your joy and happiness, even with being able to pass exams at university, and let alone with your spiritual insights. Why haven't anyone told me about this? And so, of course, the only thing I can do to remedy that is to teach you. It might not happen this retreat or the next retreat, but it will happen. One, you can do this because it's like the lotus is right inside of you right now. All these beautiful nimbutas, you just need to follow the instructions, just don't do anything, be still. And know that thou art God, as it says in the Bible. This is kind of what happens. Life is really interesting. There is, there was this book which I was told about and there was uh, YouTube interviews by this lady in Hong Kong, Anita Murajani. Have you heard about her, read about her? She had these cancers, many of them, and was having an operation over in Hong Kong. She was Indian, but she was working over in Hong Kong. And when she had these operations, eventually that she died on the operating table. You know, had this out of the body experience. And she described it as going towards this light, merging in this light. And she called it union with God. Her experience was, this was it. She was just totally immersed in God. She was a Christian, or a Hindu, I forget which, but anyway, it's the same thing which any Buddhist would happen. You're immersed in your mind, in the jitta. And then when she came afterwards, she called it pure love, ecstasy. Like nothing she'd experienced before. When she came out, out afterwards, she got what always happens, insights. Never remember hearing about from that stillness you get insights. And the insight which she got was the one which was most important to her, about her life and death struggle, about cancer. She came back with this insight that uh, it was because she was trying to please others. She was a very successful woman. But nevertheless, no matter what she did, she always thought she could do much better, do more. And that tension inside of her, not being at peace with herself, not accepting herself with all her faults, that was what was the cause of her cancer. In these deep meditations, you see that very easily. So when she came out, when she woke up, out of the, out of the out of the body experience, she told, you know, one of the anesthetic wore off enough, she could speak. She told her doctors, I'm cured, the cancer's gone. And they thought she was crazy. And then, when they checked, it did start to go really quickly, they didn't know why. And she totally survived. And an interesting aside to that story, I love saying, and just how karma works, it's just weird. The her GP at that time in Hong Kong was uh, a doctor called Brian Walker. And he said that changed his life, the way he was treating people in, in medicine. So he moved to Australia from Hong Kong and he found a nice job in a small town in Western Australia called Serpentine. He's our local GP and he's even my doctor. If ever I have to say who's your doctor Ajahn Brahm, it's Brian Walker. He comes to monastery often whenever he can and got time off. He was actually the GP of Brian Walker. It's amazing just how things tend to get together like that. But anyway, he's seen this, he knows it. 
So this is actually when, on that occasion, the, a person just goes into the realm of the mind, in the jhanas. And if you want to know what the pleasure feels like, this is how the Buddha described it. One of the uh, descriptions was, he called it Sambodhi Sukha. This is a Pali term. When I read that, it is like goosebumps almost every time. Sambodhi means enlightenment. Sambodhi Sukha literally means the happiness of enlightenment. It's not enlightenment. Everybody knows that, but it's damn close. I don't know if I should use the word damn, but it's that close. Even the Buddha called it enlightenment happiness. Would you like to have a taste of enlightenment? Real taste of enlightenment, not fake. If you experience the first jhana, you come out afterwards. You get an idea of what we're about, why people like Ayachanda give up this world and do such a difficult job of being, at the moment, the only bhikkhuni, the only bhikkhuni in the whole of UK, and Scotland and Ireland and everyone, isn't it? Yeah. Why on earth do we do this? Isn't there a simpler way to live a life? When you, when you know what we're doing, why we're doing it, just to get a taste of that Sambodhi Sukha, wow. And that's right inside of you right now. Be kind, be aware. And it opens up by itself. See beautiful nimittas come up. You don't need to fear with them. Keep them still. Don't worry about them. Don't think, what the heck is happening? Is this right? Is this wrong? Just keep on going. Be still. And you have the taste of enlightenment. Pretty cool, eh? <laughs> <laughs> it is cool. Okay, that's the one for now. Tomorrow, uh, if it happens and you want me to do it, we talk about the jhanas. No more. How many of you have been to the four holy places in India? <laughs> Which ones? Which holy places? Yes. You know them? <laughs> There's so many. Which are the main ones? The Varanasi. Um, well, uh, the Deerbaka. Is that where the Buddha lived? No. That's where the Buddha's body lived, <laughs> where the Buddha hung out for most of the time, was in first jhana, second jhana, <laughs> third jhana, and fourth jhana. If you want to visit the holy places where the Buddha lived and feel what he felt, develop these jhanas. You don't need visas or air tickets to get there. <laughs> experience the first jhana, second, third, fourth. Then you visited the places where the Buddha lived. And any Sri Lankans here, if you understand that, then you'll understand the elephant's footprint simile. Just as the, uh, the Arahat Maitreya, Arahat Mahinda, that was his first sermon which he gave in Sri Lanka. I often wondered, why did he give that sermon? There are so many other sermons. He explained the importance of the four jhanas. That's where you see the Buddha. Okay. Da da da. <laughs> now, sada sada sada. Sada sada. Do <laughs> yeah. Okay. Oh. Now what, what we do? At least I, I did it at the right time anyway. Sort of. Close it up. Yeah. Yeah. So you have a break, a uh, tea break, little tea break, mm -hmm. and then we gather at a, about two, but maybe two, maybe two o five, eh? Then you can actually get time for some tea, for some guided meditation. Guided meditation. Where does the guided meditation go for till two thirty? Two forty five. Okay. Mm -hmm. We have a break, and then we do a guided meditation.
to go on a journey to visit the places where the Buddha hung out. <laughs>